I've just explained how the nerve cell depolarizes and then repolarizes again. But of course, the important property of an action potential is that it can propagate down the axon. It's necessary because you need to communicate something from the central nervous system, in our case, to our muscle fibre. And that muscle fibre, it might be a muscle in your finger, so it could be a good long distance away from the spinal cord. And you need to communicate that message rapidly, but also very effectively. The signal mustn't fail. And one of the properties of action potentials is what's known as their all-or-none nature. And that refers to the fact that if you initiate an action potential, it will continue all the way down the axon, it will be the same size each time, and it will always transfer itself all the way to the end. And every action potential you generate subsequently will look exactly the same as the first one. So how do action potentials propagate along an axon? Well, the action potential is initiated within the cell. And if the cell is in the central nervous system, there's different ways in which it might be initiated. It's going to relate to the opening of various receptors on the dendrites of the cell within the spinal cord or wherever it happens to be. And that's going to be due to the various neurotransmitters that are released in its vicinity. The cell will depolarize as a result of the information that's fed to it from other cells. And that depolarization, that initial depolarization, will open a few of the sodium channels at the very beginning of the axon, at what's called the initial segment, which is where the axon has just emerged from the nerve cell itself. Now, if you open a few of the sodium channels there because of this initial depolarization of the cell, then what will happen is you'll get your positive feedback, your action potential will be triggered, and it begins at that initial segment. Now, if you imagine the sodium ions which are moving into the cell at that point, if the sodium ions are moving in, and the interior is becoming more positive as a result, and that's the depolarization. The positive ions inside, they don't really want to cluster together in a big positive cloud. They're going to repel each other. They're going to repel other positive ions. So instead of just staying in this big positive cluster, the positive ions will tend to move along the axon. And if you think about it, if you imagine dividing the axon into segments, and we'll say that our first segment is where the action potential is taking place, and this region is depolarized. The next segment, well, that isn't depolarized yet, and so its resting membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts, the interior is negative, and so what we have is two adjacent segments, the one where the action potential is occurring, it's positive inside, the one next door, it's negative inside. And so the positive ions that have come in during the action potential, they would really like to move along the axon, to the negative region, and so they do. So positive ions flow along the interior of the axon, and they will reach the next part of the membrane, the next segment if you like, and they will depolarize the next segment. The next segment will become a little bit more positive because of those positive ions that have moved along the axon. In fact, if you're thinking about positive ions flowing along the axon on the inside, you also need to remember that there are also positive ions moving in the opposite direction on the outside of the cell. And that completes what's called a local circuit current. And that local circuit current is what depolarizes the next part of the membrane. Now, with a small depolarization of the next segment, that's enough to open the voltage-gated sodium channels which are located there. And that means that more sodium comes in, and that means more depolarization and more channels open. And that initiates your positive feedback cycle, which means that the next bit of membrane experiences an action potential as well. And then the positive ions which have entered there, well, they move along the axon to the next segment. They initiate the depolarization there. That kicks off an action potential in the next segment, and so on and so on and so on. And as a result, the action potential propagates all the way along the axon. Some people liken this to lighting a fuse on a stick of dynamite. So you light the fuse in one position, and then the heat and the fire in that position will start to set off the next bit of fuse and the next bit of fuse and the next bit of fuse, and as a result, the signal propagates all the way along. It's a similar thing in a nerve cell axon, and that gives you your all or none propagation all the way to the end. Now, what I've described so far is appropriate for an unmyelinated axon. I haven't talked about myelin yet. Of course, in many axons, especially the fast conducting ones in vertebrates, in us, we have myelin which forms a sheath around those axons. In the peripheral nervous system, 
there is a special cell type called Schwann cells, and the Schwann cells wrap their way around and around and around the axon, and they effectively insulate it, because the myelin sheath that they produce is a fatty sheath, Fat is an insulator, and they're insulating our axon in lots of different positions along its length. Between the myelinated segments, we have a little gap called a node of Ronvier, and it turns out that it's in the nodes of Ronvier that we have the voltage-gated channels where all of the action takes place. So what's the purpose of the myelination? Well, I suppose you can think about this by making an analogy with a hose pipe. Imagine that your axon is a hose pipe and it's attached to a tap and water is coming out of the tap, it's moving along the hose pipe and the idea is that you want to get the water to the other end. In our case, water is the electrical current, if you like, the signal that we want to send from one end of the axon to the other. Now imagine that you had a hose pipe which was very leaky, so someone has put lots of holes in the rubber all the way along. You turn on the tap and water tries to move along the hose pipe, but of course a lot of that water leaks out. And as a result, the current maybe doesn't get all the way to the end. Perhaps it doesn't get very far. Now what we could do if we wanted to improve the delivery of current along our axon, or improve the delivery of water to the end of our hose pipe, is we could take some tape and we could patch up the holes along its length. And what would happen then is that there would be less leakage, and that means the water has got no choice but to travel further along the pipe. Now that's essentially what myelin is doing. It's working as an insulator, and in the myelinated segments, which are called the internode regions, within the internodes, current can't really leak across the membrane because you've got the myelin in the way, and that means the current tends to travel further, and it travels across the internode region, and it gets to the next node. Now at the next node you've got the voltage-gated channels, they all open, and that basically reinforces the signal. You've got a sort of boost, if you like, to your action potential there, and then the positive ions coming in, well they'll move along the pipe again to get to the next node, and the next node, and the next node. Now the advantage of this is that it speeds up the propagation of your action potential. It speeds it up quite significantly. The way it does this is quite complicated. And if you look in the textbooks, you'll find discussions of what's called length constants and time constants, which allow you to get a more physics-based view of exactly what's going on. I'm not going to go into that at this point. Suffice it to say that myelination will speed up your velocity of action potential propagation to a nice high value. As I said, between 100 and 120 metres per second in our very fastest fibres. The problem occurs if the myelin is absent, and demyelination can occur in association with lots of diseases, for example, multiple sclerosis. If you don't have myelin on your axon, the problem is that you've now got a long segment which is very leaky between your two nodes of Ronvier where your sodium channels are located. And that means that some of the positive ions, they try to flow along the axon, but they're going through a demyelinated region, and that means that a lot of the positive ions can simply flow out, they can leak out of the axon, and that means that the current which arrives at the node is going to be much smaller than it normally should be. And the problem is that if the current that arrives at the next node is too small to initiate the action potential there, then your action potential will fail. It's no longer all or none, and that demyelinated nerve can't transmit an action potential all the way from one end to the other. So the nerve fibre fails, and of course this ultimately leads to the problems that we see in multiple sclerosis and similar diseases. So if you've got the myelin in place... It works very well, it's very fast propagation. It's also quite cheap propagation because that means that overall less sodium is coming in because it doesn't leak out so much. If less sodium comes in, less has to be pumped out and that means less ATP. So it's fast and it's cheap. The only problem is that if you lose the myelin, you're in trouble. The relationship between action potential conduction velocity and the diameter of nerve cells is something which is quite important. It turns out that smaller nerve fibres will conduct action potentials at a slower velocity than larger nerve fibres. But the relationship differs depending on whether your nerve fibre is myelinated or unmyelinated. And of course, as a natural condition in us, we have lots of unmyelinated fibres, forming, for example, the grey matter of the central nervous system, and many of our pain fibres, our so-called C fibres, 
are unmyelinated as well. The basic relationships were considered in a famous paper by Rushton in 1951. And what he concluded is that for an unmyelinated nerve fibre, the conduction velocity is proportional to the square root of the diameter. For a myelinated nerve fibre, the conduction velocity is simply proportional to diameter. And what Rushton did is he put these two relationships on the same graph. So the x-axis is the diameter of the nerve axon, the y-axis is the conduction velocity. For the unmyelinated nerve fibres, because velocity is proportional to the square root of the diameter, you have a curve. But for the myelinated fibres, if it's proportional to diameter directly, you have a straight line. And Rushton found that the curve and the straight line cross at an axon diameter of around 1 micrometer. Now, what this means is that if your nerve fibre is wider than 1 micrometer, if the axon is wider than 1 micrometer in diameter, then it pays to be myelinated. You're going to be a much faster conducting fibre if you're a myelinated fibre. Whereas if you're a very narrow nerve fibre, a very small one, you're actually going to be slightly faster conducting if you're unmyelinated. And this explains why the very smallest fibres in the body tend to be unmyelinated fibres, and the big fat ones, the fastest conducting, are myelinated. Now there's some argument about whether the curve and the straight line cross in the correct position. And people have challenged Rushton's results and suggested that, in fact, one micrometer is perhaps not the place where the crossover takes place. But the general conclusion still stands, that small fibres tend to be unmyelinated and large fibres tend to be myelinated. If we think about the propagation of action potentials down a myelinated fibre, what we're saying is that the sodium comes in at the node of Romvier, Positive ions flow along the fibre to the next node of Romvier, which reinforces the signal, if you like, and then it carries on to the next one and the next one and the next one. Now, because the sodium is only flowing in at the nodes of Romvier, and then you've got a big gap until the next node of Romvier, it's almost as if the action potential is jumping from node to node to node. And that's why the conduction of action potentials in a myelinated axon is referred to as saltatory conduction. Saltatory means jumping, so it's like the action potential jumps from node to node. But that's a little bit misleading, really, because if you think about what's going on between adjacent nodes, you've still got this local circuit current. You've got the positive ions moving towards the more distant node inside the cell, and you've got other positive ions moving back in the extracellular fluid. So you've got that local circuit current. But it's as if the local circuit current has been drawn out, been extended for a long distance, rather than simply causing the ion channels in the immediate next part of the axon to open, as it would in an unmyelinated fibre. It's just as if you've taken that local circuit current and drawn it out, so it travels a long way. And it is a long way, because the internode region in an axon can be a millimetre in length, which from a cellular point of view is an enormous distance. So you really are travelling a long way to get from one node to the next node. And that's why you've got a real problem with your demyelinating diseases. If you lose that insulation, the signal's not going to get to the next node and your action potential is going to fail.